All right. So low power, we see some hyperkeratosis, see some acanthosis, and what looks to be like a reticular formation of a support keratosis. Very good. And then if we were going at low power, we can kind of look in this lighter pink area. It'll get there in a, in a minute, I think, yep. hopefully. <laughs> But yes, from low power, like you said, it looks like a perfect separate keratosis. Acanthosis, interconnected uh, strands of <clears throat> keratinocytes with some increased pigment and nice, beautiful horn pseudocysts that you can see in some areas opening to the surface. Um, and anyone who's a beginner watching this, this is one of the many different patterns of separate keratosis. There are many different, different types of uh, appearance that they can have. Microscopically, you can see there's some inflammation like we often see in seborrheic keratoses. Um, and then here, finally, those pale pink areas are coming into view. So now tell me about those, please. What's going on here? Okay, so if we look at the pale pink areas, we see some scattered deposition of pigment. And then we also see kind of this pink amorphous little balls that could be the keratin-derived amyloid with the cracking that we see. Beautiful. Exactly. This is pink keratin-derived amyloid filling the papillary dermis, just like in the case of macular amyloid that we saw earlier. It's the same exact process. It's just that here it's occurring in association with this seborrheic keratosis. But it's the same thing. Pink amorphous deposits with cracks in between them and trapped melanin pigment. And here you can see a little more clearly how the process happens. It is actually dying keratinocytes falling down from the epidermis and getting smashed together in the papillary dermis. Basically, they're like savat bodies, cytoid bodies, um, dead keratinocytes, and they're getting crunched together. So you can see how that process looks. That basically, if you get a lot of cytoid bodies or savat bodies or dead keratinocytes packed together, it makes the keratin amyloid, okay? And you can look over here and you can see it in action right there. Uh, you can see this kind of dying keratinocytes and almost interface type change, and then the dead keratinocytes falling down and getting squished together in the papillary dermis. So a great example of, of that keratin-derived amyloid uh, process in action. And here it's just a bunch, it's a, a lot more abundant than we saw in the macular amyloid. And it's just incidentally seen in this seborrheic keratosis. And you can see it, you often do see this uh, in association with seborrheic keratosis. You can also see it with a variety of other epithelial neoplasms, including basal cell carcinoma, sometimes benign hair follicle tumors, and others. So, so anytime I see this, it's a pretty thing. I point it out to the resident who's sitting with me, and then I sign this case out as inflamed seborrheic keratosis. I do not mention the amyloid in the uh, comment or anything because it doesn't matter clinically. There's no way that this could be, in my opinion, no way this could be systemic amyloid or light chain amyloid because it's got the, it's, you can see the cytoid bodies there. You can see the pigment. It's only in the papillary dermis. Um, I've never, to my knowledge, seen a case of systemic amyloid present in this manner. So I don't, I just don't mention it. I guess you, if the only reason you'd mention it is that like in the microscopic description, if you wanted to make it so that you could easily search for it later for teaching purposes. But in that case, just write down the number or get yourself a teaching recut now. Uh, don't, I don't put it in the report because I don't want someone to read it and freak out um, when it's totally benign and incidental finding that's pretty but doesn't mean anything clinically. So this is just a, a fun microscopic curiosity that's important for pathologists and dermatopathologists to know about so that they don't see this and freak out and think it's something like systemic amyloid. So that's the main reason we're having this conversation now is so that when you see this, you know, oh, cool, that's pretty, and it doesn't mean anything bad for the patient. So, you know, there's, I like to say there are three reasons why we split and make these little distinctions about things. The first one is because it's something important for patient care, right? We treat it differently or it has a different prognosis. That's the most important reason that we split entities into different subtypes. And so we do that and we mention it in the report and it's important because it's gonna change patient care. Um, the second reason is because we do it so that pathologists or people, anyone looking at the slides knows, hey, this looks different than other examples but it doesn't mean anything probably clinically. So, you know, this is a, just a, a variation of a benign seborrheic keratosis, or this is a different pattern of dermatofibroma uh, that looks very different from other dermatofibromas, but still benign and doesn't need any different care or de any different treatment. And the third reason that we split entities out in, in medicine is because people have to get published, right? And so it's, you can laugh, it's kind of funny, but it's also true. So that's, that's my, I, I don't know if anyone's ever described that before, but that's my, uh, Gardner's theorem of, of splitting. 
Um, if someone wants to, to name it that, then, then we can. And I'll finally have an eponym because I'll never get an eponym or uh, anything named after me otherwise because Gardner syndrome's already been taken long ago by someone who's not related to me. So, and there you go.